Welcome on into Falcons today by Chat Sports. Matthew Peterson here, combing through Atlanta's depth charts after the big first rush of free agency and before the NFL draft, just to kind of recap all the moves the Falcons have made so far. Now, quick PSA: I am filming this video Monday afternoon. I've got some PTO coming up later in the week. A friend is visiting me, but I didn't want to leave you guys without a video for the day. So hopefully, none of this gets changed with a signing or a trade or something like that. But let's get right into it, starting with the quarterback room, where it's a pretty lonely room so far. It's like Kirk Cousins and Taylor Heineke, right? Logan Woodside and Desmond Ritter no longer on this roster at the moment. Ritter being traded, Woodside being a free agent. So you can expect a third quarterback to be added, at least for training camp, even if there's no serious contention of putting them on the 53-man roster. So whether they do that in the draft or with a very cheap, you know, low-level free agent signing like another Logan Woods side, you can expect a third quarterback to be added at some point. Now, the question kind of becomes, though, how is Taylor Heineke still on this roster? And at the moment, the Falcons are a little over $2.5 million, you know, below the salary cap, I should say, so $2.5 million in the green. And they've got the eighth overall pick in the draft. All those draft uh, spots, their salaries are predetermined. The Falcons draft class is going to cost them about 12-ish million. So Atlanta actually has to, you know, free up some money by that. And they can restructure contracts to avoid moving on from players, but Heineke at six and a half million dollars in cap savings. I still am very much open to moving on for him for the cap savings alone. I understand that they want to have a veteran backup for Kirk Cousins as he's coming back from an Achilles injury, but does anyone feel like Heineke showed us anything last year to believe? He's ever worthy of starting another game for this team because I didn't see that play out of him. On to the running back room. You got B. John Robinson, Tyler Algier, then you got Avery Williams and Carlos Washington. It's a big drop off after Robinson and Algier. So I think ultimately when you got B. John, it doesn't really matter who's behind you. But that may be a that may be a spot where Atlanta tries to add another name during the draft in day three. On to the wide receiver room though. Drake London, Darnell Mooney, and Rondale Moore, those are your top three wide receivers. I think that is subject to change via the draft. If Atlanta uses their eighth overall pick on a player, that will surely shake things up here. Kadero Hodge was brought back mostly for special teams purposes. Ray Ray McLeod also being signed to be a gadget kick punt return man for this team. But when you look at the top three receivers on this team, I think Drake London's resume and just the, his overall play speaks for itself. The guy put up 905 yards with awful quarterback play last year. When he gets Kirk Cousins throwing him the rock, he's going to have 13 to 1,400 yards. Darnell Mooney, Rondell Moore. We've seen some good years from Mooney uh, earlier in his career compared to lately. Whereas Rondell Moore, I think this is just a win of a trade for Atlanta because at least you got something for Desmond Ritter. And the Cardinals move on from a failure of a second round pick. But I think there is room to grow in this wide receiver room. So don't be surprised if Atlanta goes wide receiver at eight, or if they go Dallas Turner, then they may look at wide receiver in rounds two and three. So should the Falcons go wide receiver at pick number eight? I think Roma Dunze and Malik Neighbors are better overall players than Dallas Turner, but there is that uh, level of need for this team. Right now, edge rusher is a bigger need than wide receiver, right? But... I'm just thinking that might be something we look back on in a few years ago. Cannot believe the Falcons passed on a Roma Dunze and a Malik Neighbors. And how do they go in the same draft class together with Marvin Harrison Jr.? All right, let's move on to the tight end room. It's pretty skinny, and I'm not crazy about that. Kyle Pitts, he has had some injuries, you know, well, just the one year, so I'm probably being a bit too nitpicky. Charlie Werner, more of a blocking tight end, although he was kind of stuck behind Kittle in San Francisco. So maybe he can grow into a larger role as a homecoming for him. But Pitts is obviously the main guy on screen here. Three seasons so far with the Falcons. As I film right now, still awaiting the decision on that fifth-year option, whether or not Atlanta would like to pick it up. But they're going to need some improvement from Pitts because he just hasn't been there. For being the fourth overall pick in the draft, I know the quarterback play has been spotty at best, but at some point, like talent just has to overcome average to below average QB play, and you got to be a difference maker for this team. And we saw uh, some highlights of that last year, but now we got to see him put it together for a full season, especially in the red zone, where he has just been 
Casper the Ghost. I mean, just been invisible, essentially. Now, if a move happens or when a move happens, because that's sort of been the trend for this team so far in the offseason, you know we'll be breaking it down here on the channel. So join one of the largest, I believe the largest, Atlanta Falcons YouTube community, aside from the actual Atlanta Falcons YouTube channel, and get with 21,000 strong today. On to the offensive line. Not a lot of movement in this position group because not a lot of movement needed. It's one of the better offensive line units in football. Jake Matthews, Matthew Bergeron, Drew Dahlman, Chris Lindstrom, and Caleb McGarry. The only thing Atlanta needed to do was add a swing tackle. They brought back Storm Norton, Storm Norton all-time name, and Tyler Vrabel. Storm Norton filled in nicely last year at different uh, moments for McGarry and Matthews. I know Caleb McGarry may not be the most popular of the bunch, but if he's your worst offensive lineman, have a look around the rest of the NFL, and you can see how much worse it could be. Now let's switch gears to the defensive line. At this moment, it is Zach Harrison, David Onyemata, and Grady Jarrett starting. If they bring back Calais Campbell, I think he would have his spot on the defensive line back next to Onyemata and Jarrett. Uh, they also re-signed Contavious Street, which I really like from a depth standpoint because he played very well after being traded from the Eagles last year. I think a sneaky X factor on this team, though, is Zach Harrison. He finished last year on a very high note, 33 tackles, 3 sacks, 4 tackles for loss, a lot of that production coming in the last month or so of the season. So the former third-round pick from Ohio State, I think myself included, fans can be quick to just like, oh, you're not impactful your rookie year? we got to find a new guy at that position. There's some patience required. And I think Zach Harrison, if he can you know, not be you know, a 10-plus sack guy, but if you can get 5, 6 sacks out of him in a rotation on that defensive line, that could be a sneaky difference maker for this defense in 2024. On to the linebackers now. you got Arnold Abikati, Caden, Caden Ellis, Nate Landman, and Lorenzo Carter. I think this linebacker room, especially on the interior, is very strong. It's the outside linebackers I've got my questions about, right? I mean, you just think about the roles of inside and outside linebackers. And Caden Ellis and Nate Landman last year, they combined for seven sacks. Evacati and Carter, I mean, they were not the one-two starting players. It was Bud Dupree in that mix as well. But they combined for nine sacks. I mean, you're almost getting more pass rushers out of your interior linebackers than your, out, your, your exterior linebackers. So there needs to be a facelift at that pass rushing unit from the outside linebackers' perspective. Inside, you're great. I mean, I'm curious to see what happens with Troy Anderson and Nate Landman. I'm inclined to believe Nate Landman will hold on to the starting job, but... If anyone gets injured, you've got a great backup in Troy Anderson. On to the corners now. A.J. Terrell. I've got Clark Phillips starting and then D. Alford. Now, Mike Hughes can definitely push Alford or Phillips for one of those two, one of those two starting roles. But we saw Phillips kind of take over from Jeff Okuda last year at the end. So I've got him as a starting CB2. And then I got D. Alford at the nickel spot. But the question is, is Clark Phillips ready to be a starting cornerback? Last year, there were some good moments and some not-so-good moments. And hey, everyone has that in their rookie season. If you just crossed off everyone because of a bad stretch in their rookie year, there would be no one in the NFL left. So patience is required. And I think Clark Phillips, a player I was super high on coming out of Utah, did not have any interceptions last year, 27 tackles, five pass breakups. But in a larger role, and sure, you're going to want to add some depth at that position because it's just super thin right now. You've got five cornerbacks on this team. You're going to want to double that number going into training camp. So expect that to be a position they target not just in the draft, but after the draft. If they miss out on some of their top guys, then they look to sign some really cheap UDFAs or veteran players just to get a good roster together for your 90-man training camp opening day. And then you whittle it down to your top five, your top six. But is Clark Phillips ready for a bigger role? We're going to find that out during training camp. All right, on to the Falcons' safety room now. Jesse Bates, one of the best safeties in football, if not the best safety in football last season. DeMarco Hellams took over the starting job pretty much from Richie Grant towards the end of last season. Now, Grant played a whole lot more. So when you look at their stats, obviously he's going to have more production to his side. But I think the pro football focus rank definitely uh, speaks volumes, right? Richie Grant ranking 89th out of 95 qualifying safeties. Helms, the seventh, seventh round pick out of Alabama, 
57th out of 95. So, yeah, you can grow from that. It's not like DeMarco Helms is just a shoe in for the starting job. But I do think he showed us some really good promise for 2024. And at some point, it is nice to hit on some of those day three draft picks because it's just super cost effective compared to constantly having to go into free agency and signing a veteran safety. Like Even if you signed a cheap veteran safety to a one-year, $5 million contract, right? That's five times the price that DeMarco Helms would cost. Was he five times better? Often teams will go, no, like he may be two times better, but we've got a good rising young player that's super cheap. We'll ride that wave compared to just constantly going to free agency and kind of stunting the growth of our farm system. So how would you rate the Falcons roster Madden style? Scale it one to a hundred. For me, I would give it an 80, 83. I think you need some more pass rushers to get closer to 87, 88. So for me, it's on that tier of B to B minus an 83 overall grade. That will do it for us on this edition of Falcons today. If you enjoyed our coverage, I request that you go ahead and subscribe. That way you can join the best Falcons news and rumors channel out there. Mm -hmm.